This is the audio portion of the webinar. Group link sites, please signify whether or not you can hear our recording at this time through responding through the WebEx communications. We program momentarily. Today's program is Home Care Services Today, Impact on Transition Planning from Hospital to Home. The Meridian Health Institute for Evidence-Based Care is pleased to bring you this webinar. A few comments on continuing education credits. Participants must remain for the entire session in order to claim continuing education credits. They must complete the appropriate session evaluation found on the website and fax it to 732-776-4837 with contact information so we may return your certificate and you are in a group viewing session. Further requirements on accreditation. One thing contact hour will be provided by the Meridian and May Center for Nursing, which is an approved provider of continuing education in nursing by the New Jersey State Nurses Association. Accredited status does not imply endorsement by the NA Center for Nursing or ANCC of any commercial product or service. Meridian is also accredited by the Medical Society of New Jersey to provide continuing med medical education for physicians. Meridian designates this live activity for a maximum 1.0 AMA PRA Category 1 credit. There is no commercial support for this activity. Speakers have declared that they have nothing to disclose, and it is free bias. Free bias. Housekeeping details. This webinar will be available for viewing for at least the next six months for Meridian employees via the webcast website, www.meridianiebc.com. It will be available online 24-7 throughout this time in YouTube and media play formats. The ability will begin approximately two weeks after today's live broadcast. Please encourage your colleagues to complete this webinar. We will have time for questions today, but if you have any for our experts, please send them to the Institute for Evidence-Based Care, care of Kathy Russell Babin at meridianhealth.com, and we will ensure you receive a prompt response. Object for today's program is to describe current best practices in home care services that may impact transition care planning. We will discuss some current evidence regarding home care, home care, past and present, and projections of home care in the future. Speakers, Kathleen Russell Babin, MSNRN, is Senior Manager for the Institute for Evidence-Based Care. Since 19, excuse, 2008, her role has been to assist interdisciplinary teams to identify and implement best practices as well as to carry out research demonstration projects. And Farina, MSNRN, APN, Director of Certified Operations for Meridian Home Care in Osh County, has been Meridian since 1999. She manages and directs day-to-day -day clinical and business functions for over 500 clinical and administrative personnel. Her efforts have produced high levels of patient and employee satisfaction at Meridian at Home. Kathy McCudden Raspoli, RN, Director of Intake and Sales at Home Programs, has been at Meridian since 1988 when she joined Meridian Home Care as a staff nurse. 
Kathy most recently assumed business responsibilities that created a complete revision of the business care model for Meridian at, at home. Now, comments about today, the, the evidence in today that's multiple and varied for the topic of home care. We will merely take a few snapshots of the most recent research available. In the heart failure, Stewart and colleagues in 2012 published on the impact of home versus clinic based management of chronic heart failure. They implemented the WISH trial, which stands for which heart failure intervention is most cost-effective and consumer-friendly in reducing hospital care. This was published in the Journal of the American College of Cardiology. Center Random Control Trial 280 hospitalized heart failure patients to either home-based care or heart failure clinic care. The differences in mortality as an endpoint were not significant. That is to say that one was not superior to the other. Both produced similar effects. Home care was able to reduce the duration of unplanned hospitalizations, although it did not reduce the actual hospitalizations or rehospitalizations. Planned admissions thereafter were similar, whether it's for all causes admissions, cardiovascular or heart failure admissions. However, the days were significantly different. For all cause reasons, the reduction in days was 35%. For cardiovascular reasons, the reduction in days was 37% re uh, reduction. Although heart failure patient days were less, average of 4.96 versus 3.64, they were not statistically significant. However, overall were significantly different for and better for the the home based therapy group. A item for hospitals today in the United States is that they're being penalized for readmissions in heart failure, MI and pneumonia. The admissions may be um, penalized when they are for any cause. In twelve Levine and colleagues study home care for at-risk patients. Home care programs for patients at risk for high um, rehospitalization rates were studied in a group of older patients with multiple chronic conditions. This was published in the American Journal of Managed Care. The controlled trial studied patients randomized to choices for healthy aging program versus usual care with 156 patients ending up in the treatment group and 142 in the usual care group. The goals program were early identification and exacerb of, uh, exacerbations, health education, disease self-management, advanced care planning, and there was delivered by a multidisciplinary team. The results were the intervention group was significantly hot, uh, greater in their satisfaction fact, to the tune of 18% better in their patient satisfaction than usual care recipients. The intervention group was also less likely than the usual care patients to be uh, usual care patients to be admitted to the hospital, over 12% less likely, such that the admission rate per thousand was at 500 for the intervention group and 664 for the usual care group. However, there was no difference in terms of cost of care between these two groups. Interesting evidence also comes from orthopedics, where Fromson and colleagues published in 2013 in the Clinic Journal of Medicine. They put regarding home care following total knee replacements and used a rapid recovery care path emphasizing pain control and early return to function. Decision making and patient education were considered critical to the success of this program. Evidence to support their their work spanned a decade, and you see them highlighted here on the page from 2000 to 2007. Their results at the Cleveland Clinic, where average length of stay was reduced by an average of 0.9 days. They also found that the charge home rate increased from 32% before the program to 74% at the conclusion of the study period. So embracing the protocol actually uh, discharged the patients to home at a rate of 74% while 
while remaining surgeons discharged to home at a rate of 45%. This difference was also significant. Most interesting was the readmission rate for those discharged to home using the newer protocol was significantly lower compared to the rate before the protocol, but also significantly less than the rate of the cohort discharged to the skilled nursing facility. In the experimental stages is the concept of hospital at home. This was pioneered by the Johns Hopkins University Schools of Medicine and Public Health, but most recently highlighted by the Presbyterian Health System in New Mexico. Cryer and colleagues published on this finding in Health Affairs Journal in 2012. October 2008 and April 2012, 582 patients were involved in hospital at home. Patients meet uh, specific eligibility criteria to be included, but come from a, a myriad of conditions, as listed on this page, from CHF to dehydration. Patients referred from emergency departments as well as inpatient settings and even PCP and clinic uh, providers. Physicians visit the patients daily, and nurses visit one to two times daily. Telehealth nurses provide additional remote support. Generally part of Presbyterian Health Medicare Advantage Program, Medicaid, or bundled payment commercial options. Integrated delivery system cautioned the need to expect create an effective bundled payment option in order for this to be su successful. They lower fall rates and mortality rates, although one may consider that these may be related to the less acute eligibility requirements. However, the mortality rate was 0.93% for hospital at home versus 3.4% in inpatient care. Hospital satisfaction was significant, with pregnancy results for hospital at home at 90.7 raw score versus the inpatient at 83.9. For length of stay in program or hospital were also significantly different, with the stay in hospital at home for 3.3 days of service versus inpatient care, 4.5 days of service. How admission rates, as you see, are similar. The fame to fame made was that the, the actual hospital at home costs were 19% lower, presumably due to the huge difference in days of service. These are a few of the programs that we highlighted for the research behind home care today. We are now going to turn over to Kathy McCutt and Rispoli to begin the review of home care past and present. Home past. Our home health in America traced back to 1813 in South Carolina when the Ladies Benevolent Society of Charleston brought food, health care, and training to the sick and the poor. In 1988, a Liverpool philanthropist, William Rathbone, utilized nursing care for his terminally ill wife. This experience became the catalyst for his philanthropic future. Florence Nightingale, they formalized and developed the idea of home nursing and began training and preparing women to be health educators as well as nurses to the sick at home. Rath and Nightingale are credited with the start of organized district nursing in England. This term referred to the community being divided into districts, each served by a nurse and a social worker. In the United States, visiting nurse associations emerged in Buffalo, Boston, and Philadelphia in 1885 and 1886. Walt, born in 1867, is known as the American founder of the visiting nurses' profession. Inspired study nursing as a result of the illness of her sister, Walt's postgraduate studies led to her involvement in the home nursing of poor immigrants or east side of New York City, where she lived. In ninety-three, Lillian Wald established the House on Henry Street. This was the of the Visiting Nurse Association of New York City. American community nurses trace their origins to Ward and credit her with coining the phrase public health nurse. In the fall of 1893, with the help of another nurse, she set up an office. By 1913, she had a staff of 92. One of Wald's many achievements was to convince insurance companies, Metropolitan Life being the first, to provide free visiting nurses to their customers. 
organized home care began at a time when the most seriously ill were sick at home, and when home was the workplace for most nurses. It was the most dramatic period in the history of American health care. It was undominated by epidemics of infectious diseases and high death rates. The addition of new immigrants and the urban growth allowed previously localized diseases to spread quickly and infect larger populations. Immigrant workers in the 1800s lived in cramped tenement housing, high of unmanaged waste, inadequate drinking water, overcrowding, and poor nutrition led to outbreaks of smallpox, yellow fever, malaria, and tuberculosis. In 1849, cholera struck New York City, killing over 5,000 people, and in 1860, another 5,000 died from a wave of typhoid. Epidemics were particularly deadly to children. In 1940, almost 2% of New York's newborns failed to reach their first birthday. 1800s and early 1900s, scientists seized the opportunity to further develop the germ theory of disease a golden age of microbiology during which scientists like Snow, Pasteur, and Koch identified etiologic agents of microbial disease. Disease dynamics were halted by interrupting the spread of microorganisms. Health improvements of sewer systems and water treatments resulted in reduction in diseases and improved sanitation. Between pathogens and disease was paramount to improving the health state of the American population was focused on education, sanitation, nutrition, hygiene, and child care. New efforts to educate the public in disease prevention and treatment, and also support, and how to do well while not communicating disease to others, save thousands of lives. In 1990 in America, 1,413 nurses were working on behalf of 566 associations. Up to this point in time, agencies depended on charity and public dollars for funding. After one, the Red Cross persuaded most of its local chapters to initiate visiting nurse services and spread rapidly throughout the United States. The departures, beginning with the stock market crash of 1929, saw a decline in home health nursing due to a scarcity of funds. Many agencies did not survive. 1940s, the beginning of World War II, hospitals overcrowded with chronically ill patients. This brought surgeons in the industry as the chronically ill were brought back to their homes to be cared for. In 1965, Medicare legislation was enacted to provide benefits to home care patients. It was followed by Medicaid, the state medical assistance program for the poor, which included provisions for home care. The benefit followed in 1983. Concurrently, the National Home Care Association was founded to a high quality care to hospitals and home care patients and to act as the industry's voice. A percent of medical schools today offer training in home care. Today, chronic disease, no longer infectious disease, is the next frontier for public health. Four million Americans are receiving services from a visiting nurse. Health care costs are minimized and disabled persons and the elderly benefit from convenient care in their own homes. For patients must receive skilled medical care and rehabilitative care, but are unable to travel to a health care facility, home health has effectively lowered the rate of premature admission of these patients into a long-term care setting and preventing admissions to acute care settings. Contemporary health services are delivered home health, hospice, home infusion, and durable medical equipment directly to the comfort of the patient's homes. In Obama counties in 2012, our home health agency is Meridian at Home, um, delivering services to over 20,000 patients. In four, the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, Bureau of Health Professionals, Division of Nursing, convened the Consensus Conference on the Essentials of Public Health Nursing Practice. The group concluded that community health nursing was a broad term, referring to all nurses who practice this in the community. And public health nursing was a part of community health. The basic terms continues, but the purpose, of the purpose of professional practice remains the same, the quality care to people in the community. I'll turn the presentation over to Joanne Farina for Home Care Today. Today, we look at community health, 
Synergy Health provides us a wide range of healthcare services. Usually patients are referred to us for an illness or injury. It's expensive to provide care in the home. It's more convenient for both the patient and their families and their significant others. Many services that we provide in the home do compare favorably to the services provided in a hospital or a skilled nursing facility. Some of the examples of the skilled that home health aid services provide, we go into the home and we assess the patient for skilled nursing. We look at their wounds. We do patient and caregiver education. We do venous or nutrition therapy in the home with certified nutritionists and certified nurses in infusion therapy. We provide physical therapy, occupational therapy, speech therapy, medical social services that are able to help the patients refer to the community if they need any more services that are not provided by home care services. We have hospice care, we have home health aid services, and we have private care services. The goal of home health care delivery system is to begin by treating an injury or an illness in the privacy of their home, assist the patient in regaining their independence, and it's to be, become as self-sufficient as possible. We enable them and the family or to become independent in their care so that they can age in place and live comfortably in their home. If you home care referral made to home care, in order for services to start, we must have a physician or it's it to start the care for re the referral. The home care agency will schedule an appointment to assess their needs, and the coordination of care will be done between the physician and the home care nurse or therapist. Examples of what the home health staff will assess? When the staff arrives at your home, they will assess for the following. They look at your nutrition. They look at what kind of diet they are. They look at your vital signs, your blood pressure, your temperature, your pulse. They look at your medications. They, t they reconcile them against what you were on previously, what you currently should be on, and what you should not be taking. Based on what they're discharged from the hospital, based on the physician's orders. They assess you for the pain level that you have. They check the safety in the home. They teach and educate you about your care and how to care for yourself. And they coordinate your care and the services by communication with their patient, the doctor, and any caregiver in the home. The biggest thing with home care is what is the coverage for home care, who pays for it. Medicare Part A covers eligible home care services. Most insurance plans with a home care benefit will cover services. And services have are, are to be intermittent skilled nursing, physical therapy, occupational therapy, speech therapy, or social work, and home health aid services. What they mean by intermittent is the care cannot continue forever. The care needs to be intermittent. It's to be taught to a family member or a caregiver, and we need to have a predictable end to care. We need the care needs to be reasonable, and it needs to be necessary. The matter, however, does not pay for certain things in the home. It will not pay for a 24-hour caregiver, caregiver to live with you in the home. It will not pay for meals on wheels. Many um, patients we have have meals delivered to their homes, and it will not pay for that. It will pay for homemaker services. It won't pay for someone to come to clean your house, um, to, do, to do any of the personal needs that you might need as far as um, doing uh, meaning or going to grocery stores or going to stores for you to do your services. It will, pay, it will not pay for personal care services when Medicare benefit does not have a skill in there. And for the above services, however, there are private options. Patients can be arranged, and the patients can pay privately. Who is eligible for home care services? Well, the Medicare must certify that the patient is homebound, and what that means is the patient must have a taxing effort in order to leave the home, but they must have someone to assist them in leaving the home. And generally, they cannot work walk more than 20 feet unaided without assistance. The plan of care must be established between the physician and the nurse and the family or the patient, and services are covered only when the care provided is specific, safe, and it has an effective treatment. And frequency and time periods means to be reasonable. What that means is we cannot stay in the home forever. We go into the home on the first visit, and we start teaching the patient for discharge planning and how to become independent in their care. And the condition needs to be expected to improve in a reasonable and generally predictable time. Send patients home 
home versus a subacute or a long-term care facility. When a patient is sent to a subacute, generally the care is more comprehensive. It ha it's a cost-effective inpatient level of care compared to a hospital cost. It does require diagnostic testing or invasive procedures that are not as intensive enough to require an acute level of care. It does have active MD direction with frequent on-site visits. It's complex medical or rehab care where the patient is receiving rehab services or therapy probably seven days a week versus in the home they do not receive it as frequently, sometimes twice a day in a subacute. Care requires, however, for a patient to be admitted to a long-term care or subacute, a three-day hospital stay prior to their admission to the facility. We move to a program which most home care agencies have, and it's an IV program. The programs accept most insurance plans. They're Medicare certified. They have pharmacy services that are 24 hours a day, seven days a week for infusion therapy, and they use highly experienced specialty nurses. Home health, there are vast resources for persons in need of assistance in the home, enabling patients to maintain their independence. The services can be performed in the home, allowing individuals to receive care in familiar surroundings and it's designed to meet their needs by offering personalized services in the home. Family becomes an integral part of the care. It's easy for the family and the friends to visit. It reduces infection and reduces the admission to the hospital, and it's more affordable than inpatient care. The types of therapy that infant therapy provide are antibiotics, antifungals, antivirals. They provide hydration. They do TPN in the home, chemotherapy, IVIG, IV steroids, ionotrophics. However, we're not allowed in the home to do transfusions. Move forward, most of our referrals come from hospitals, MD offices, subacute facilities, and assisted living facilities. I'm going to discuss a little bit of a case study regarding DHF um, that we had an infusion patient on, on home care services to give you a little bit of an idea of what we do in the home and how the patients progress. We had a 71-year-old man who was admitted to home care for post-acute hospitalization for CHF, myopathy, COPD, PVD, stage 3 renal insufficiency. The goals when admitted him to service were to stabilize his blood pressure, maintain his cardiac status using an ionotropic therapy. We prepared the patient for the next step for cardiac intervention. He was either eligible for a transplant or an LAV insertion. He was placed on IV milrinone and started as a continuous drip in the home via a PICC line. The nurse and pharmacy staff managed the care via assessments, lab work, and close coordination with the physician. The patient and family started teaching after one week. They had a 24-hour on-call number for any questions or concerns they had, and the treatment was adjusted and the dosing adjusted based on the patient's symptoms and coordination with the physician. As a result, the patient's blood pressure was stabilized. His chest was stabilized, utilizing our telemonitoring in the home, along with teletriage intervention. We utilized episodes of shortness of breath with activity allowing the patient to resume some of his normal functions and ADLs. It determined that the patient was not a transplant candidate, but a candidate for the mechanical LAVD. The result, the patient was able to return to some of his normal activities. The Milner was discontinued. The LAVD was able to be inserted. And fortunately, now the patient is discharged from services and back to playing cards with his buddies. I'm now going to turn this back to Kathy McCudden Rispoli, to talk about another case study involved our TPN abdominal wound care. Our case study involves a patient on total parental nutrition with located abdominal wounds. This was a 3 year male post acute hospitalization and extensive rehab for necrotic colitis, enterocutaneous fistula, and anemia. The patient status post four major surgeries with a wound dehiscence and intra-abdominal abscess. Upon admission, he demonstrated the following. Extensive weakness, was greater than 10%, stayed pressure ulcer to his sacrum, neuropathy, drop, 
a poorly functioning costomy, and an intestinal fistula located deep in a midline incision. The had been on TPN for two months previously in an attempt to facilitate wound and fistula closure and continued to experience a high fistula output. On his appliance wear time was less than 24 hours. He was unable to ambulate and experiencing severe anxiety and depression over constant fecal soiling. The service initiated were home wound and ostomy nursing services, therapy, and TPN infusion therapy and nursing. The goal was to maintain his nutritional status and continue with his weight gain, heal abdominal wound, fistula, and pressure ulcer, prevent complications of the disease, while maintaining a functional and improving step through the rehab process. The wound and plan of care were developed and initiated under a direction of the surgeon and primary physician. Our stomal nurse initiated a colostomy, a colostomy appliance, uh, started with colostomy appliance management and instructed the family in the care of the appliance. The family patient became independent within two weeks. With full payment of all fistula drainage, and incisional healing occurred. Rehab was initiated with therapy visits, P visits three times weekly until the patient was able to ambulate 150 foot independently and safely. His sacral fracture also healed within two weeks. His parental nutrition continued at home and infusion began at 1,800 cc's over 18 hours a day via the PIC line. His wife instructed an administration of TPN by infusion nurses and was independent after three nursing visits. Suddenly, infusion nurses were able to decrease his visits to weekly for blood work and monitoring with the 24-hour on-call nurse and pharmacist available. The TP specifically compounded to meet the metabolic and nutritional needs of the patient by pharmacist in collaboration with the physician, surgeon, and nutritionist. Within months, the patient's TPN was altered to 1,800 milliliters over 12 hours. Two months later, the patient was decreased to 1,500 milliliters over 12 hours. The patient weight at starter care was 129 pounds and at discharge 156.5 pounds, demonstrating a weight gain of 2 to 3 pounds per week. In few nursing, discharged the patient in six months with TN no longer necessary. The fistula and colostomy were closed successfully with Hartman's procedure, and the patient was discharged a much healthier person, eating his own and continue to gain the weight he needed to stay healthy and continue healing. I'll turn the presentation back to Joanne for another case study. Home and home care agencies have a home re rehabilitation and total joint replacement program. Home-based delivery of care is within 24 hours after hospital discharge for joint replacements of total knees, total hips, and shoulder replacements. A week, a therapist and nurse access the patient. It is physician protocol driven, and patient and family are educated in the home setting. An orthopedic case study that I am going to present to you is a 64 year old male status post right total knee replacement. Surgical date was 129 2013. His total discharge to home was 131 2013. A scarce and a therapist went out to assess the patient in the home on um, February 1st. The level on admission ranged from 3 to 10 with constant pain and 7 on a pain med PRN. The third incision was 15 centimeters by 0 0.1 centimeters, and self-care was required with assistance with all tasks. His relation with supervision was at all time with the walker. And pay education that needed to be provided includes signs and symptoms of infection, includes falls and safety education, and using the walker at all times. All that we anticipated with the patient and that we established was to improve ambulation with the walker, to complete errors without assist, to provide DME in the home, which he needed a raised toilet seat, we provide it, to degree, and to degree, decrease his pain level. We took transfers and bed mobility, instructed the patient on range of motion exercise, pain management, and positioning techniques. We established a home exercise in the program, which we taught the patient and his caregiver how to do when the therapist was not in the home. And we established that the patient would visit the patient from 5 to 2.15 with a total of 10 visits. 
discharge, the patient was ambulating with a cane, up in 13 steps with supervision, and 200 feet independently. He had active range of motion, he had some range of motion, and he was independent in self-care, and his level had decreased from 3 out of 10, that was constant, ranging to intermittent pain from 0 to 5. He was performing his own home exercise program, and he was transferred to outpatient therapy on February 15, 2013. As we move into the future of home care, home care works closely with the hospitals regarding the readmissions. We have a health program that we've established and that we currently are utilizing to prevent readmissions back to the hospital. We utilize it in home care for CHF and COPD patients. In home care, currently, Meridian at Home is utilizing the DM Genesis Monitor from Honeywell. This advanced technology delivers dependable vital signs and symptom-specific assessment to the RN clinician. The patient is able to perform the monitor from the home, and the information is transmitted to the RN teleriage nurse via a wireless GPR uh, system condition. But CHF and our COPD patients have their vital signs monitored daily. We monitor for weight, blood pressure, heart rate. They have pulse oximeter attached level attached pulse ox attached to the monitor. And then we assess each patient depending on the diagnosis for the appropriate questions that we program into this monitor for a subjective patient answer. For CHF, we utilize are you experiencing more difficulty breathing today compared to a normal day? Have your ankles been swollen more than usual? And the OBD, are you experiencing more difficult breathing today compared to a normal day? Do you need extra pillows at night to sleep comfortably, especially last night? And have you had to limit your activities more than usual? And did you develop a cough? If they answer yes to the, any of these questions, an alert will be um, happen, and a teletriage nurse will then intervene and call the patient. The mark allows for probable disease-appropriate educational statements at the end of the patient's monitoring. The monitor not only displays to the RN clinician a red alert, but the monitor speaks to the patient stating common causes for increased difficulty. Breathing may be caused by strenuous activity. Please remain compliant with your medication. Increased difficulty contact your health care provider. It also does an educational intervention with the patient. A case that we're, I'm going to talk a little bit about, that we had a patient on the monitor was 79 years old. Had a CHF, COPD, and hypertension. Was hospitalized with bradycardia and possible need for a pacemaker insert, but medically not much of a candidate. The cardiologist ordered the telehealth program post hospitalization. Through daily monitoring of the vital signs and the patient's symptoms, the MD was able to adjust the patient's medications appropriately. He was able to prevent a 30 day rehospitalization as well as become therapeutic on cardiac med and prevent the pacemaker insertion. Currently, disease management at Meridian at Home has teamed with our Ocean Medical Center Hospital to close follow and monitor our chronically ill patients to prevent rehospitalizations. When a patient CHF or COPD is charged from Ocean Medical Center and is applicable from care services, Meridian at Home installs the telehealth program as well as skilled nursing services in the home. The patient is also evaluated for all other disciplines, such as PTOT, a home health aide, nutritionist, and a social worker. When it is stable and reaches his or her goals in the home care program, the patient is discharged from Meridian at Home, and the medical center is contracted, contacted, and the patient is enrolled in their IVR program. IVR stands for Interactive Voice Response System. The IVR program is then automated. It's a telephonic system that contacts the patient daily, asking a series of questions, and they respond subjectively by either pressing yes or no on their phone by one or two. It's continuing to prevent rehospitalization. Through close monitoring of our Medicare chronic illness patients with CHF and COPD, we can reduce and prevent rehospitalizations within that 30-day window, as well as improve the quality of life of our chronically ill patients. I'm going to turn the presentation back to Kathy McCudden-Rispoli to talk about the future of home. 
home care. The future care, a new millennium. Future home care will not only focus on medical services. It will it will not be limited and focus on the homebound status of the patient. Although this will probably continue to be a core business. Health will focus on needs of a variety of populations living in the community, provide a full range of services that focus on all ages, allowing people to obtain maximum levels of independence and self-sufficiency. Future services will be driven by the functional status of the individuals and types of services needing, ranging from low level of support to higher level based on level of independence. Service will be related to exercise and diet, Prevent care, rehab services, in diagnostics and technology, treatment home care, daycare, skill nursing, shopping, and social services. It's projected that home care in the future will look very different. One thing now is that change is inevitable. Home health, because of the cost efficiency and quality of care advances continually made in medicine, will be leaders in tomorrow's medical arena. Farina and Kathy McCudden Rispoli of Meridian at Home, and thank you all for joining us. A reminder participants must complete the appropriate session evaluation found on the website and fax it to 732 776 4837 with contact information so we may return your certificate unless you are in a group viewing situation. We you join us for our annual conference. In motion, evidence-based care, getting to the root of it all. This time we'll focus on many challenges of today, such as smoking cessation, obesity, the need for health coaching, and the expansion of services to a variety of healthcare professionals to meet today's needs. This program will be held on April 26, 2013, at the Orchard Point Hotel in Red Bank, New Jersey. Program registration information information may be found in the brochure posted to the website www.meridianiebc.com. And thank you for joining us.